oh, it's funny, the, the light might not be optimal, funny what it's doing to my hair. Anyway, uh, welcome back. Let's go to uh, lecture number six. So now this is index compression. So we've solved the problem of constructing the indices. How do we scale when the, when the data gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger? Now, it's nice. I mean, we managed to scale and so on. But it doesn't mean that we should rush into it. Because a lot of people are tempted, you know, if, if something is not fast enough, just add more machines, scale more, buy bigger machines, and so on and so on. But here's the thing. In practice, you need to sit down and think a little bit. Because as a complement to scaling and having more machines and, and being able to handle more data, you can also ask yourself, what if we try to better use the resources we already have? So the challenge we are going to take right now is, imagine we could not do the index construction in the way we see for scaling to uh, uh, the internet and so on. Imagine we are back to having a single machine, right? You have your single laptop and you are stuck because you can only handle that much data and now that's it. Now, if I forbid you to scale to more machines and to use these advanced techniques, there is another way. That way is called index compression. What if we try to squeeze more data into less space? And then at the end, you can use both. You can both compress and use the scaling techniques. So I like to take some time often to rehearse what we've done. So remember that we are in the middle of Boolean retrieval. We have this query language with and not or. Uh, you bring it in the conjunctive normal form, and then you can map it elegantly to union and intersection over postings lists. The posting lists are in a standard inverted index, which is a, 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 a dictionary of term that typically has a B plus three structure to efficiently look them up in logarithmic time. They point to a document frequency, which is the number of documents containing the term in purple. And then the posting lists in blue, which are ordered lists of document IDs. In fact, these are pairs of term documents, but for efficiency reasons, we put the term only on the left, right? So this is the standard inverted index. Uh, you can use B plus trees, it's the more popular, but there's also B trees, hash, uh, hash tables, and so on. We saw that we can extend and tweak the index with wildcard uh, queries, uh, spelling correction, phrase search, and so on. Uh, we can also uh, have byword indices where we have a sliding window of two words at a time when we index. We can extend to a positional index where now, in addition to the document ID, I also have every single position of where the term appears. I have the three gram index or k gram index generally where I have uh, all the occurrences of these uh, uh, sub words, so parts of the words. Right? So this allows me to uh, search for spelling mistakes or uh, similarity. Uh, we introduce the term IDs also to compress the terms to just an integer if we keep a mapping somewhere. We looked at the blocked sort-based indexing, BSBI is much easier to pronounce. Uh, it's a tongue twist or blocked sort-based indexing. So SPIMI is the uh, more modern version that improves a little bit over that. Here it fits on the single disk, and if it doesn't, then you use MapReduce. Uh, then if the, if the collection evolves, then you can use an auxiliary index, and the top of the top is to basically use logarithmic merging uh, to, uh, to have a strategical approach to when, you, uh, to when you merge the indices. Which brings us to now compressing. Now, we want to compress the data. We want to compress the index. It means we will want to compress the dictionary and we will want to compress the postings lists. But before we do that, we need to understand what it is that we are compressing. Because if you want to compress things, you probably will think of information theory, Shannon entropy. Who is a bit familiar with that information theory, entropy, a bit, right? If you want to do this, you need to do, to, to, to do a bit of statistics and to have an understanding of what's going on. So before we try to compress, we'll do that. And probably today, that's only uh, the only thing we, we, we will get to. So the first, there are two problems that we are interested in, in understanding. The first problem is, imagine that my collection is growing. 
I have more and more and more and more and more documents that get added. The question I ask myself is, how does the number of unique terms evolve with the size of the collection? It could be linear, it could be sublinear, it could be exponential, it could be, well, may, maybe more than linear wouldn't make much sense, but uh, we, ask yourself, we ask ourselves, how does the number of terms grow? This is just a reminder, I told you already this convention, right? Big N is typically the number of documents, big M is the number of terms, so that's the number of postings list in your index, right? The number of yellow rectangles. Uh, P is the number of tokens, so these are the positional postings. The token is really right after parsing the documents, it's all of these pairs flowing in memory, right? So these are the, these are the tokens, and that we call big P. Now, if I want to plot how my number of terms evolves when my collection gets bigger, um, that's the question I want to ask. Note, just for the sake of clarity, what I put on the X axis here, I put the number of tokens. I could also have put the number of documents, right? If you consider that documents have a certain average size or a certain size distribution, then it doesn't matter if you look at the number of tokens or the number of documents, right? It's roughly a constant in between, right? Just having said that. But basically, where do we think we are? Let, let's do some sort of poll. Who thinks that if I grow the size of the number of documents or tokens, the terms will grow more than linearly, like exponential or quadratic? Nobody, right? Of course, because that's a cap, right? It cannot be more than the number. Okay, so it's at most linear. Who thinks it's linear? Nobody. Who thinks it's, so this one, I would say the square root. Who thinks it's in the square root of the number of documents? A few raised hands, okay? Who thinks there's something asymptotic in here? that it's kind of grow. Okay, so we have a majority even there. That would also have been my guess, right? I would also have believed it's there. Why? Because the number of words in a language is limited, right? So you have you should have a cap at some point that you, that you converge to. Um, now, if we would like to figure out, we could run an experiment, right? We could just have a plot, accumulate data with various collections and various numbers of terms and so on. Typically, we could do a linear regression, but in order to do a linear regression, we just we might need to apply some transformations. So in fact, what we do in practice is the one that works is a linear regression, but over the log and the log. So you accumulate data points, you take the log of the number of tokens, the log of the number of terms, and try a linear regression, it turns out that it works. You can actually see that in practice, the logarithm of the number of terms is uh, 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 some line, uh, well, not necessarily going through the origin, but it's basically a line in the way it depends on the log of the number of tokens. So now it means that you can express this as log m is some constants times log t plus a constant. If you bring, if you remove the logs and just bring yourself back to the uh, to the linear world, then it's basically some constant e to the a that's a constant times the power of t. It turns out that it works. Now, what is the value of a and b? Only a linear regression can tell us. And it turns out if you do the linear regression, that b is roughly one half one half. One half logarithmically, it means the square root, right? To the power of one half is the square root. So this is surprising. It was also surprising to me, but it turns out that the number of terms evolves in the square root of the number of tokens. So it, it doesn't, it, there is no cap. It doesn't stop. It just continues. So maybe this is because, I don't know, in the web, there are also many more tokens than just the existing worlds. People uh, construct new worlds uh, for some reason. But anyway, it's, it doesn't cap uh, in any way, it just continues. So this is the square root, k times the square root. And k typically is uh, somewhere between 30 and 100. I don't even need to know that by heart. But basically, this is, uh, this is the idea in practice. Um, so this is a first law. I think I, I, I always confuse it. I think this is Heap's law, right? That's Heap's, this one, right? Okay, so this is Heap's law. There is two laws. There is Heap's law, and there is a tongue twister for the other one. It's Heap's law, the other one, Heap's law. So this is Heap's law. Um, and Heap's law is a different one. It's on the number of terms. 
Tip's law asks the question, if I count the number of, um, of documents in which my terms appear, the number of tokens, the number of times they appear, how does that, how does that distribute? Um, you would imagine that the more popular terms, like the, it's the stop word, basically, V, of, and, to, in, they're all over the place, right? I actually took Wikipedia, I did it on my laptop, I downloaded some, uh, some, uh, some uh, statistics, and I plotted the, uh, the, uh, the, I sorted by occurrence, by number of occurrences, all of the terms. It turns out you get some hyperbole, one over X. So it means that in the log log scale, it's again a line, but this time B is minus one. It's not one half, it's minus one, right? So this is absolutely amazing. It means that you basically have this, uh, this, uh, this thing, like the, the, the number of times that, uh, that uh, it's going to, uh, to appear is one over N. I didn't hear anybody scream, but actually this is worth screaming because that doesn't normalize. You, you know the sum one plus one over two plus one over three and so on? It doesn't converge, that just goes to infinity. So this is also a very surprising result, right? You, you, you might have expected something that, 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 that converges somewhere, but it doesn't. So this is again a very surprising result. So this is called Sip's law. There is Heap's law and Sip's law. Heap's law is the, 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 there is the, the evolution of the number of terms is in the square root of the, uh, of the, uh, um, uh, of the number of documents, and here the 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 the, the evolution of the the frequency of appearance of the uh, of the term. If you sort the terms by decreasing frequency, is one over n, right? So it's a constant divided by the rank. So this is it for today. I just wanted to show you Heap's law and Sip's law. Uh, very surprising. I hope that you will still have enough appetite to eat now that uh, that you know about these two surprising results. But uh, this is it. And then next week, we'll just go into uh, how we can use these results in order to compress the dictionary and in order to compress the posting list. So next week, expect some highly mathematical lecture where we'll, uh, we'll compress a lot of things and squeeze the standard inverted index into less space. Thank you very much. I'll let you go with uh, two minutes to, uh, to grab uh, your meal. Um, enjoy the exercises. Uh, with the TA team and uh, see you next week at uh, 10 a.m. for the continuation. Thank you very much.